Hi everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. We've got another 48k Spectrum to repair today, but get this, this one's come all the way from New York. I've had machines coming and going from all over the world, including Canada, but nothing from New York yet, so this is a first on me. The serial on the case starts 034, so this isn't a particularly early Spectrum, maybe an issue 3 or 4 in there. I did notice this little hole in the back of the case, I'm not totally sure what that's all about. If you do know, leave a comment please. The owner I know has had a crack at repairing this and it's a tricky one which is why it's had to make the journey across the pond. Um, he's done some refurbish steps like replacing these feet with round ones, that's fine, that should work. Um, and the keyboard membrane will need replacing and he's going to take that on as well. So we're just interested in the electronic repair. So we can see there is a socketed RAM chip, there is a VLA82 in there, that's a major step on a repair job, and a socketed Z80 and ROM chip, so lots of work's been done here. Oh I also see a switching voltage regulator has been placed, and the capacitors have been replaced too. So this has had quite a bit of work, let's have a little look around the board. The work done on the capacitors is fine, and also on the power circuit. I do know from the history of this board that the power circuit produced smoke once and the owner identified the part which blew up and replaced it and everything looks fine. There's also a composite video mod being applied which is also fine. Um, I would use a smaller package but there's nothing wrong here and won't be adjusting that. Let's just take a look inside the case to make sure everything is in order in here. And yeah, I can see that the resistor's been desoldered from the socket, everything is fine. Here's our replaced, or at least socketed, RAM chip. I know that memory problems are suspected on this board, so I imagine we'll be replacing more of those. This is the voltage regulator that's been fitted. I don't recognise it. Uh, I'll check the output of it. I'm sure it's fine. Now since the power circuit has produced magic smoke in the past, I'm going to do some basic checks. First by checking continuity around the coil. And the way I do this isn't very scientific. I'm going to check it um, between all four pins in every possible combination of red and black probes on either side and then I'm going to compare the results with a similar board and make sure the values look similar. Most importantly we don't want continuity between the two coils. Here's our similar board. There, there are a couple of mods under here but it shouldn't affect our results and everything does look okay with the coil, so we're going to continue with testing the rest of the board. The next test also doesn't involve applying power, I'm just going to test the resistance from each of the power supplies to the lower RAM to ground and make sure that none of those is too near zero. And yes, no issues evident here. Next, I'm going to remove as many chips as I can and apply power and check the voltages of these three supplies to the lower RAM. We're looking for minus 5, plus 12 and plus 5 and all the voltages are present. So this has basically been the usual startup test. We've just been a bit more cautious because of the history of the board and its faults and the magic smoke issue. For our next step I'm going to replace the Z80 and the ULA. Plug it in again and see if we get any kind of picture whatsoever. Obviously the machine's not going to work with the ROM chip missing or the lower RAM chip missing but we should get a picture of some kind, so let's plug it in and see what happens. And it's not looking good, I just got a black screen, nothing at all on the screen, which makes me suspect the ULA chip, which is slightly concerning, because that's an expensive chip in there. Well, I brought the scope out and scoped some data lines, and I actually found that the data lines were totally flat, there was no activity whatsoever going on in the spectrum which means we might have a chance that the ULA is okay and our clock, our crystal, could be the issue. So let's have a look. I'm just probing around here looking for any sign of life at all. There was nothing at all. Now here's the clock, here's the crystal output. We can see that this crystal down here is outputting a nice sine wave. The crystal above is outputting nothing at all. I did test both legs and didn't get anything showing up at all. What we wanted to see here was a nice 14 MHz sine wave which feeds into the ULA. 
The ULA then generates the clock which, which goes to the Z80 using that sine wave. So it's understandable that having a missing oscillator here would lead to the system doing nothing at all because the Z80 wouldn't be receiving its clock signal. So let's get that crystal X1 out of the board and replace it with a known good one. Here's one from a similar board which I know is working fine. And we'll cross all our fingers because if this doesn't fix it then the ULA is probably dead and has been pulling the clock signal or the oscillator signal to zero. Well, spoiler alert, you may notice the ULA has been swapped. Uh, it was the ULA that was dead. The crystal was fine. And I'm now able with the new ULA fitted to turn the spectrum on to a black screen like you can see here. This is where it gets interesting because what this tells me is there's a problem with the memory. Probably the lower memory, the Spectrum ROM is not completing its memory test. So let's run a diagnostic ROM and see if it can tell us which of our memory chips is failing. Ah, this wasn't expected. The memory tests are passing and they're passing in hundreds of soak tests I left the thing running, but still the Sinclair ROM won't boot. So let's try a different diagnostic ROM. Here I've got the uh, Brendan Alford's ROM. Let's see what that tells us. Maybe the testing in these scripts can find the problem. Well, this one's telling me that all of the RAM chips have failed. And um, if I do the same thing with another EEPROM, a different diagnostic ROM, it also tells me all the RAM chips have failed. Um, and those of you in the know are screaming at me now that I can't just drop an EEPROM in like this. I need to do some mods to the board first before I can run an EEPROM. That's why it thinks all the RAM chips have failed. Let's compare the pins for the original Sinclair ROM on the left with the EEPROM on the right. We can see pin 1 is expecting a voltage that it's not getting. A14 on the EEPROM is labelled uh, chip select 3 on the original ROM. We have a chip enable on pin 20 which is labelled chip select 2 on the original ROM. Our remaining address lines are all the same which is great. And the same goes for the data pins, all 8 of them. VCC, our 5 volt supply, is the same. The third chip select, or the first chip select, CS1, is labelled output enable on the EEPROM. And our grounds are the same, it's just labelled VSS on the EEPROM diagram here. But it's the same thing. So what does this mean, what are we going to do? First thing we need to do is connect VCC to pin 1, which is uh, the PP, the programming voltage, on the EEPROM. It doesn't matter that we're not giving it the programming voltage it needs to program, it just needs to be pulled up to 5 volts. Chip select 3 becomes A14, but we're not going to be using A14 when we address the ROM chip, the EEPROM. So what we can do is choose to pull this to ground or plus 5 volts, essentially giving us a choice of two banks so we could put two ROM images onto this chip. Pin 20 is a bit more interesting. The Spectrum 48K PCB was designed to take both Hitachi and NEC ROM chips and for each of these a different signal needed to be routed to pin 20 of the chip. This was done using these links on the PCB. So what we're going to do is follow the recommendations from Retrolium. I'll put the link in the description and we're going to feed MREC and ROM CS to pin 20 with an AUR gate, as you can see, we're using two diodes and a 10k resistor. And when we do this, we'll be able to use the EEPROM chips with the various diagnostic ROM images on to hopefully find this memory problem, this elusive problem. So step one, let's get these links removed. These things are kind of beefy, so be careful if you end up removing them for whatever reason on your board. You could probably damage pads and tracks fairly easily prizing these things out. I'm actually just going to do a quick continuity check here uh, to make sure that everything is in order before I continue with the mod. Step 2, at least in the order I did it, I'm going to link pins 1 and 28 like we discussed using this little length of wire. I'm not cutting this to perfect size, it's not going to be super neat because I'll be reversing this mod once the spec is up and running so it's back in its original state. And thanks again Retrolium for the instructions, but here's our AUR gate, uh, quite neatly put together in the original joints for the 
rumblings. The 10k pull down resistor is on the underside of the board, it's just the way it worked out for me. Okay, I'm running the Retroleum ROM first, um, because I've already ran that on the other replacement ROM chip. I want to check I get the same result, and yeah, it ran the memory tests fine. So let's try the Soak test in the Brendan Alfred's ROM, and as you can see, Soak test iteration 1655. Uh, we're not finding this fault using ROM chips, that's for sure. We're going to have to start probing around the board. But where should we start? Well, here's a clue. This is the keyboard input test on the same EEPROM chip and we are getting constant key presses on 4, C and J and I'm talking rapid, you can hear it clicking. It's uh, definitely a problem to do with or around these keys. Here's a keyboard schematic and we're going to highlight our troublesome keys 4, C and J and ooh, they're on the same row, that's quite interesting. Um, the corresponding address lines are 11, 8 and 14, but it seems very unlikely that those three would have a problem. Much more likely a problem with this signal KB3 from the ULA, or D3 on the data bus which it corresponds to. Time to start probing around like a madman, and I checked all the continuity and checked the shorts around these KB1 through 5 signals highlighting as I went along on the schematic here, no problems. But then I had a breakthrough, and I'm going to have to explain first of all if you've noticed that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 more chips are socketed. Um, it took me a long time to have this breakthrough, but here it is. When checking the resistance of the data lines individually to ground um, across all of the 8 lower RAM chips, I found I was getting about 8.5 kilo ohms, at least on this multimeter setting until I got to the RAM chip which corresponds to D3 which happens to be the data line highlighted on the keyboard schematic so as you can see we're still getting about eight and a half kilo ohms until we get to D3 where we get more like five and a half and moving along back up to eight and a half so that's a definite discrepancy and tells us that there's a problem with D3 somewhere on this board Here's a schematic showing the troublesome data line and the corresponding RAM chip IC9. And just as a reminder, D3 was our quote bad data line around the keyboard circuit. Investigating further, I removed the ULA chip to try to isolate the fault, and in doing so, the fault went away. The resistance jumped to about 12 kilo ohms, but there's a chip removed, so that's fine. But the resistance wasn't different between D3 and the other data lines. Putting the chip back in and the fault comes back. 5.5 kilo ohms on D3, 8.5 kilo ohms on the other data lines. In the end I didn't need to do this but I replaced IC9 just to be sure that wasn't part of the problem here and it turned out it, it wasn't, it didn't resolve the issue uh, unfortunately so unnecessary step there but you know no matter. What was interesting was, as you can see here, I'm measuring 9 kilo ohms on each of the data lines. This is after replacing the chip, but the reason is not because I replaced that chip. Take a look at the ULA. The ULA is only plugged in on the right hand side of the chip. And I did this on purpose as part of the fault finding procedure, um, and it did produce this interesting result that the fault wasn't present. Now let's pursue this line of investigation and Put your pitchforks down, this is a dead ULA from the graveyard, don't worry. But I'm going to start systematically bending pins out and plugging the chip in looking for this fault to return. Hopefully by doing this and isolating the pins I'm going to find the one which is causing our problem. When one of these pins on the left is plugged in, our resistance to D3 drops too low. So I'm going to keep bending pins systematically until I can find the one pin and, hen and therefore the one signal which is causing our problem. And here we are, I've got it, 5.5 kilo ohms, let's have a look. Only one pin plugged in on the left hand side and that pin, as it happens, corresponds to the interrupt signal. So all we have to do is trace the interrupt signal around the board until we find a shot. And I found it, it's here underneath the Z80 chip, right there, interrupt is shorted to D3. And that is the cause of our weird little memory fault on this board. 
I might be wrong here, but this kind of makes sense to me. Here's our symptom, we had a black paper and a white border, suggesting that the memory test had run, and then the system crashed. Well, the very first command in the Sinclair ROM is to disable the interrupts before the memory test starts. Here it is at address 0, DI, disable interrupts. And then at the end of the memory tests, uh, the maskable interrupt is now re-enabled. I don't know, boffins, comment below, tell me if I'm right or wrong on this, but that seems like a nice little coincidence that our symptom is that the memory test crashes at the end where the interrupt is re-enabled, and we had a short between interrupt and a data line. Right, enough waffling, let's fix it. Fixed it. Done. Lovely. Now we can play games on it. Um, well, actually, first I need to de-socket the ULA and stick a heatsink on as part of the service jobs, but then we can play games on it. There's our ULA out, let's clean up these joints and bung it back in. Excellent, boy am I happy to get this thing running. It has been a pain, I've wasted so much footage. This video could be 45 minutes long if I showed you all the diagnostic steps I took that led to dead ends. But hey, all worth it in the end, we have a happy customer, we have a specy revived and we learned a lot along the way, perfect. It can be frustrating when it's a simple fault like a short, so what I'm going to do is take it out on Thorin. Thanks for sticking around till the end, please like and subscribe.